Um, welcome to Occupational and Environmental Health Grand Rounds. My name is Sam Goldman, and I'm filling in uh, very briefly today for my colleague, Ramat Balogan. Today, the division is hosting the PESU sponsored fourth annual Herb Needleman Lecture. Uh, as you know, the full Grand Rounds schedule is available on the division website, along with information on our upcoming CME course that will be held at the, uh, the San Francisco Marriott Fisherman's Wharf on March 7 through 10. If you want to receive CE credit for today's attendance, please mark your attendance using the survey link that we will paste into the Zoom chat or check the email reminder that Lucia sent out earlier. And now uh, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our own Dr. Mark Miller uh, to introduce the uh, today's uh, lecture. Hi, welcome everybody. I'm Mark Miller from the Western States Pediatric Environmental Health Specialty Unit or PESU, which co-sponsors this series along with the Program for Reproductive Health in the Environment and the UCSF Earth Center. The PESU is housed here at UCSF in the Occupational, Environmental, and Climate Medicine Division and is part of a national network funded by ATSDR and the US EPA. Our program develops educational material uh, for clinicians, the public, public health, uh, and, uh, and others uh, to address environmental health related questions in children and pregnancy. Herb Needleman was a pediatrician, child psychiatrist at uh, Harvard and at the University of Pittsburgh, and a hero to all of us who work in children's environmental health. In the 1970s and 80s, Dr. Needleman's studies provided the first clear evidence that lead, even at low levels, could affect a child's IQ, attentiveness, behavior, and ultimately involvement with the juvenile justice system and problems into ad adult life. He worked tireless, tirelessly and at great personal cost to force governments and industry to confront the implications of his findings, and as a result, was the target of relentless attacks from industry. He fought off his critics with courage, tenacity, and dignity, and ultimately was exonerated of charges of scientific fraud and misconduct, and won the right for all of us, for those accused of such charges, to an open hearing with legal representation. Dr. Needleman's work was instrumental in the EPA's decision to mandate the removal of lead from gasoline and by the Consumer Product Safety Commission to ban lead from household paints. Herb gave the following advice to young investigators. Do not avoid difficult areas of investigation. Take risks. If scientists exclusively choose the safe routes and avoid controversial research problems, and play only minor variations of someone else's themes, they voluntarily turn themselves into technicians and our craft will indeed be in peril. So now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Stephanie Holm, who's the director of the Western States PACU to introduce our esteemed speaker. Absolutely, thanks so much, Dr. Miller. Um, and you can go ahead and screen share while I'm, I'm introducing if you like. Um, so it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tamara James Todd. She is the Mark and Catherine Winkler Associate Professor of Environmental <clears throat> uh, Reproductive Epidemiology. She directs the Environmental Reproductive Justice Lab, which seeks to investigate the role of consumer product chemical exposure on reproductive and cardiometabolic health and health disparities. She takes a solution-oriented approach that includes running several randomized controlled trials to improve environmental health literacy of consumer product chemicals at a strategy, as a strategy to reduce risk of adverse health outcomes and health disparities. She's the PI of several R01s, including the ERGO study. She's also a PI for the Community Engagement Corps of the MemCare P42 Superfund Research Center and the Deputy Director of the Harvard Chan and NIEHS P30 Center. All right, take it away, Dr. James Todd. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to um, present 
for this particular lecture. Um, I, Mark, you kind of made me teary eyed over here. So I'm trying to get myself together <laughs> after that. Um, so I, you know, again, it's just really a privilege to, to be here with you all today. Stephanie, can you see my screen without kind of any impedance? Like, is there anything in the way? Okay, great. It looks lovely. All right, lovely. So um, today I have, you know, a few moments to speak with you about some ongoing work that we've been doing in our lab and that others have been doing that really um, speaks to the point of uh, and the importance of thinking about the role of environmental health, um, specifically as it relates to consumer products um, and consumer, consumer product chemicals and pregnancy health and thinking about how we as scientists might be able to take a health equity approach uh, to the work that we do in the, in the space of environmental reproductive justice. And let's see if this will advance, lovely. So just a really uh, quick um, overview of what I'll be talking about. I'm gonna speak to you a bit about pregnancy as a sensitive window, specifically for cardiovascular um, health and then provide you with a framework that I'm gonna use throughout um, this, this uh, talk um, to really frame and think about environmental exposure sources and um, disparities and in inequities. Um, and then give you some very specific examples from the work that we're doing um, that kind of speak back to that framework and then kind of what I might suggest as a way forward for us. Um, I probably don't need to say this to this audience, but I do want to ground us in, in a space where we recognize and realize that we really do indeed have um, a crisis ongoing with pregnancy-related mortalities here in the U.S., and that this is a growing issue. And while it occasionally gets, um, you know, sound bites um, here and there, um, I think that because it kind of cycles back through ever so often, we don't realize that this is continuing to kind of um, increase and um, it's it's quite worrisome. So um, really being able to uh, think about what's what's behind this. And so when you look at the causes of pregnancy related deaths um, by time um, during pregnancy and in the period following pregnancy, what I wanna draw your attention to is uh, boxed here in the red boxes that much of this um, is really driven whether you're looking in pregnancy um, uh, specifically and then more so beyond pregnancy by these cardiovascular related uh, factors, um, some of which emerge and show their presence in pregnancy. And so the question is, might we be able to do something about that? So if we think about pregnancy as a stress test, and here I'm just showing you um, an example of this um, as far as a conceptual um, uh, model um, that we might think about pregnancy as a stress test, where the blue uh, population represents kind of a generally healthy population and the red um, um, group, uh, the red um, um, uh, lines here represent the, the kind of a population for whatever reason, is at higher risk. Now they could be at higher risk of a particular condition. And here on the y-axis, I am showing you uh, vascular dysfunction. And so this might be an increased risk of developing some sort of cardiovascular related risk factor, or cardiovascular disease. Of clinical relevance, that's if the individual crosses or the, um, this black um, threshold, this clinically relevant threshold. And so what's happening here with these two lines is that um, these folks are experiencing, just for sake of parsimony, two pregnancies. And so that's these two blips um, here um, that are happening uh, for both uh, the red and blue or the high risk and average risk population. What's worth noting is that the, the group that um, is at higher risk is crossing that clinically relevant threshold in both pregnancies. So that might be indicative of the individual developing preeclampsia or gestational hypertension, um, some other, you know, cardiovascular related condition. And importantly, what's also happening is that those individuals cross that clinically relevant threshold much earlier on in midlife. So in other words, these individuals might be diagnosed with cardiovascular disease, um, you know, at, in, in midlife at an earlier age, which might be indicative of more severe disease or at least you know, more challenges with um, really managing the disease for a longer period of time in a much more costly way. 
And so the question is, is there some information that we might be able to gain from pregnancy that we could then um, intervene upon? So we, we've done this, obviously. We have all sorts of um, in, interventions that we thought about, including baby aspirin, that we develop these targeted interventions or even lifestyle interventions. And um, that might reduce the, the risk and the developing these conditions in subsequent pregnancy or even in later life, delay the onset of cardiovascular disease. And uh, it's worth noting that, you know, pregnancy itself is a, is a part of just the normal physiology of pregnancy, um, a state of metabolic challenge. So, you know, what, what I showed you before is really due to the, the normal changes that are required um, for fetal growth and development, um, including, you know, just changes in being able to maintain a healthy pregnancy that lead to increased insulin resistance, um, increased inflammation, altered coagulation, and changes in lipid um, handling and vascular uh, functioning. And if an individual is unable to kind of overcome those necessary changes, you know, various conditions can occur, um, including conditions that we study in our lab, such as gestational diabetes and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, um, as well as obesity and, and preterm birth. And it's worth noting that when we kind of connect back to, um, you know, what's, what's going on with respect to um, um, pregnancy-related mortalities, that these conditions may be, you know, not only um, occurring more so in certain populations, um, such as um, non-Hispanic Black, Hispanic, um, and Asian individuals, but it may also be that um, these these that there's something that we might be able to do about it. And it doesn't just stop at pregnancy. Importantly, these pregnancy complications, as I just mentioned, may signal later life sequelae, such as the development of cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes. Um, even kidney um, um, disease. So, you know, again, thinking about these conditions too, even in later life, affect certain populations more. And, and what what might we be able to do about it? Um, you know, it, and does it stop at some of the, you know, you know, current interventions? And while those interventions are able to reduce the risk of the development of these things by, you know, around 50%, what about the, you know, other components, other things that we might be able to do? Are there environmental factors that are at play? And so I want to kind of give us um, this, you know, health equity approach, as I mentioned in, in the title of the talk, and thinking about how might we start asking different questions if we really were to use a health equity lens. And um, health equity is defined as the state in which everyone has a fair and just opportunity to achieve, to attain their highest level of health. And when we're thinking about that, we really need to think about how we might ask questions that address historical and contemporary injustices. And certainly in the context of pregnancy health, there's been a lot of discussion and talk around um, social determinants of health in which some oftentimes environmental health gets lumped into that. And thinking about um, issues around uh, structural racism, perceived and personally mediated racism and so on. But I would like to push it a bit further when we're thinking about that in the context of environmental health and thinking about what puts people at risk of risk as it goes with respect to environmental exposures. And then thinking about ways in which we might be able to eliminate economic and social um, and other health barriers. So how can we make sure that people are able to you know, not be exposed? Um, what might we do within communities or within individual neighborhoods or even for an individual in the way that they uh, that may mitigate exposure risk. And then overcoming obstacles um, as, as, for, as, as it relates to safety and um, adequate health care. And that could even include making sure that um, clinicians that are working with pregnant people are well informed of environmental health risk um, and specifically specific to um, you know, neighbor, socio, neighborhood, socioeconomic, and even cultural uh, beliefs around things that may expose people to things that um, what they would otherwise not be exposed to. And that from that perspective, we may be able to eliminate uh, preventable health disparities. So when we're thinking about this, um, we constructed this 
environmental health equity framework, a really solutions-oriented approach that effectively builds on this idea um, that um, was proposed by a model um, um, from uh, Thomas Kuhn some time ago, but really builds off of that to think about the role of observation, traditional discovery research questions, and then really getting us to move beyond our traditional questions um, that we often ask to solution-oriented questions. How might we be able to really design um, studies that allow us to get at not just the what, who, where, and when, or not just stop at our observations of differences and disparities and inequities, but to really start asking why and what are the drivers and then designing and building interventions that we can test for possible solutions so that can, we can really achieve the goal of ensuring the health, uh, the best health for all. So, you know, I wanna give you some examples of traditional and, um, and novel risk factors. And, you know, we landed in the space of really understanding at some point, uh, we asked the questions um, um, that were that, that that were around these kind of lifestyle and demographic factors. So we know things like family history or personal medical history um, are risk factors for pregnancy-related health outcomes, particularly as it relates to cardiovascular disease. We know lifestyle factors like smoking and diet, um, and things like obesity or where people live and you know their economic spending power. All of those things. Um, you know, are kind of traditional factors that we've found, you know, links um, with. And we even um, have found that, you know, pregnancy itself, as I just mentioned, is predictive of um, later life uh, cardiovascular uh, risk and other adverse um, outcomes. So if you've had a previous pregnancy um, with gestational diabetes, um, you might be at risk for having a subsequent pregnancy with gestational diabetes, for example. Or if you had some sort of fertility uh, related issues, um, or you have polycystic ovarian syndrome, you might be at increased risk for having a pregnancy uh, complication or adverse um, pregnancy outcome. But some of the underrecognized risk factors that I, I feel like we might want to think about spending more time on and, and consideration on are things like stress, um, as well as uh, violence and both personal exposure to violence, but also what's going on in our communities where we live and how that impacts our environmental exposures. Um, and then really thinking more specifically about what, you know, effectively gets under our skin and impacts um, um, our, our health through those environmental exposures, such as consumer product chemical use. And so that's what I am going to spend some time talking about today. So some examples of environmental risk factors that I'm not going to go into um, today. I, certainly, there's links between things like air pollution and pregnancy health. Um, um, many of my good colleagues, um, I'm sure many of you are thinking about um, the impacts of climate change, whether it's extreme heat or wildfires and other um, um, things as it relates to pregnancy health toxic metals, and then, like I said, what I um, am gonna be spending my time talking with you all about today are these chemicals. Specifically, I'm gonna be talking about a class of chemicals that are found in consumer products known as endocrine disruptors. And these, um, you'll see the abbreviation throughout this presentation, EDCs. Um, I'm giving you a few examples of consumer products that commonly contain endocrine disrupting chemicals. And um, they range from pesticides um, to plasticizers. I'll be talking a lot today about phthalates, um, surfactants, which um, you'll hear me talk a bit about per and polyfluoral alkyl substances or PFAS chemicals, um, and uh, phenols and flame retardants. And what's worth noting is that these chemicals aren't necessarily like arbitrarily put into products. They have properties that make our modern society, um, you know, like make us find them particularly useful. So the plasticizers, for example, um, like phthalates may hold fragrance in the products or may be used in food packaging and um, allow for us to have kind of easy disposal of things. The surfactants are water resistant and uh, grease resistant. So, you know, allows us to have certain types of clothing that, um, you know, um, umbrellas, raincoats, and so on, but also uh, foods that may be greasier, oilier, it allows us to not um, you know, have to deal with or worry about having grease all over our hands or ourselves. So 
um, you know, they, each of these has a property that are that that's helping um, us to achieve our goal of kind of living in modern society, but also can be incredibly uh, deleterious to our health. Um, so what does that have to do with the earlier um, um, pregnancy as a stress test piece that I showed you? Well, I mentioned that there could be a whole host of reasons why somebody um, may be on a, have a, you know, altered trajectory or be of higher risk for, a, you know, for adverse pregnancy outcomes and later life um, um, health uh, consequences such as cardiovascular disease risk. But in addition to some of the things that we know that like family history or, you know, stress, it could be that higher exposure to these chemicals contributes to that. And so what I'm showing you here is a, a model that um, our group um, really uh, tries to highlight here where we have, again, these two different populations, one that has a higher exposure to these endocrine disrupting chemicals. So they enter into pregnancy kind of already with an altered um, metabolism, altered metabolic state, because these endocrine disruptors um, are have been shown both in human and in animal studies to alter metabolism. And so they, they in the context of pregnancy as a sensitive window, because of all of those changes that I mentioned to you earlier um, with respect to vascular changes that are required and um, changes with respect to glucose and lipid handling, that when you involve or expose um, an individual to these chemicals, it actually could perturb what is kind of a well-oiled machine, if you will. So that could contribute to increased gestational weight gain and increased risk of gestational diabetes and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy, which in the long term could really continue to like ramp up this um, um, overall metabolic change. So when a person delivers, um, they have to return to a normal non-pregnant metabolic state, which requires them to lose weight, um, kind of, you know, no longer be as insulin resistant anymore, have their vasculature return to normal, so their blood pressure returns to a normal non-pregnancy uh, state. But again, if perturbed by these chemicals, um, there, there's the possibility that there's increased weight retention, insulin resistance, and um, higher blood pressure that could after you know subs over subsequent uh, periods of time and even potentially subsequent pregnancies um, really track with an increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease even earlier in life. So I just want to you know ex show you a bit of data that um, really may speak to the importance of thinking about these consumer product chemicals as a source of disparities that we see with respect to. Um, cardiovascular related uh, factors in pregnancy and potential contributors to some of those disparities that I showed you earlier with respect to the health outcomes. So I wanna start again with that framework um, that we'll start with just an observation. Um, there's There's been many observations showing these differences in environmental exposure um, inequities as it relates to these endocrine disrupting chemicals. I'm showing you um, an older um, slide only because um, it I, I think it kind of is a good um, uh, since a good take home message. It's worth noting that these data are from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, and so it's a representative sample of the U.S. population. Um, they've been people in various groups, and so this is looking at men, um, self-identified men versus self-identified women. Um, and I this is specifically looking at the plasticizer chemical type. So these chemicals that are used in consumer products, including personal care products, diet and food packaging, and um, medical tubing, medication, and plastics. And the graph on the left is showing you that um, individuals um, who I self-identify as women across the board for these different types of uh, phthalate metabolites. So we measure the metabolites uh, because these are rapidly metabolized. And we also think that these are the active um, things that are actually impacting um, um, the endocrine system and health in general, um, that, that individuals have higher concentrations. And the, the, some of the, the highest are these that are found in personal care products. So MEP stands for monoethyl phthalate, MNBP stands for um, monobutyl phthalate. Um, so that's the first and the third. Um, bar, bar set. And um, the, the fact that these are fragrance um, associated products or chemicals and um, um, nail polish associated chemicals, 
is is you know of concern and also just showing you the racial ethnic um, differences so these are um, um, in, in Haines, they oversample both African American and Mexican American individuals. Um, and so just again, showing you that these, these differences exist uh, specifically for uh, personal care product associated um, chemicals. But what about pregnancy? So that was in a non pregnant population. So data that we just published in environmental health perspectives um, from a pooled um, cohort analysis. Um, this was work that we that we've done. Um, Kelly uh, Ferguson and Barrett Welch led this uh, research project, um, where you know about six thousand pregnancies uh, are represented here. And I want to just draw your attention to uh, this is stratified by again race ethnicity. And I'm using for this talk across the board race ethnicity as the social. Um, determinant in the context of health equity, but we could think about a variety of things ranging from ability level um, to socioeconomic status. But just for the sake of a, a one hour talk, I'm using race ethnicity. Um, but I want to draw your attention to, for example, that MEP or monoethyl phthalate, the, the metabolite that um, um, is associated with fragrance, being much, much um, higher in concentration among the, the, the non Hispanic Black population. Um, compared to um, the, the concentrations over here in the um, non-Hispanic white population and the Hispanic population being somewhere in between. But what about timing, like across pregnancy? Does it matter? I mentioned that these are non-persistent chemicals. They're rapidly metabolized. And, you know, for many years, people thought these things couldn't be harmful in any way because they're metabolized in a period of hours. Um, and the the we looked this is data from the Life Codes Pregnancy Cohort based here in the Boston area. We had the opportunity to look at measurements that were collected across pregnancy as a part of prenatal visits. And so what I'm showing you here, again, is uh, by race ethnicity and these two phthalate metabolites that are associated with personal care product chemicals. And um, you see that compared to um, uh, non-Hispanic white individuals um, for um, um, the, the the Hispanic population for monobutyl phthalate has much higher concentrations and maintained that across pregnancy. And for monoethyl phthalate, again, that fragrance associated uh, chemical, um, it, it it this is both the black and the Hispanic population maintained um, significantly higher concentrations of these chemicals across the different time points in pregnancy. It is worth noting that there is this dip that happens in mid-pregnancy that could be and actually, when we look at the data, it looks like this is attributed to some cha behavioral changes that are happening, which, again, thinking about, um, you know, the next steps, I want to just put a little seed plant that that might be helpful to start thinking about what might we be able to do about reducing exposures. Just as another example, so I showed the, the phthalates or those plasticizers as non-persistent chemicals, but I wanted to show PFOSs as persistent chemical examples. And we do see, um, for some years, actually, it was said that, oh, PFAS, there's no, um, you know, uh, inequities that are, you know, we're all exposed. And the truth is we are all exposed. This is, you know, um, most of the U.S. population has PFAS um, um, chemicals circulating in our bodies. The challenge here is that it depends on where you live. So we have geographic differences and, uh, um, and racial, ethnic differences depending on where you live. And so these chemicals are those surfactants I mentioned to you. Um, they come both from water contamination. There was a recent study um, by uh, Jared Liddy and others here at Harvard that showed that even municipal water um, sources um, um, were the, the, the PFAS concentrations varied by sociodemographic factors. And so um, it's quite worrisome, but these were also those chemicals that I said are water resistant and um, grease resistant. Um, and so used for a variety of purposes, including occupational exposure. So um, used in things um, uh, like firefighting foam and so on. Okay, so now that I've given you the background on the environmental disparities, I, I wanna bring us to the questions that we typically ask as scientists, as an environmental uh, reproductive epidemiologist, um, I've been taught that these questions are the questions that matter. There are traditional discovery research questions. We typically ask what, so thinking about, you know, what are the chemicals and what are their associations with particular health outcomes or, 
you know, who's at most risk or where and when. And we really want to understand this as it relates to disease risk. So to kind of give you a really high level overview of some of the work that we've been doing um, here in the Environmental Reproductive Justice Lab, as it relates to those um, kind of traditional questions, um, again, um, I'm going to be highlighting two different chemical classes. I'm going back to phthalates, again, those um, non-persistent chemicals that are um, used as solvents and so can hold fragrance in, but also used as, you know, they're plasticizers. So um, I'm noting here that this is data from the Environmental Reproductive Glucose Outcome Study, or the ERGO study. Um, it's a, a pregnancy uh, cohort that was founded here in the Boston area. And we looked at gestational diabetes as well as impaired glucose tolerance. Again, um, we, we note a variety of associations, but we also looked at this, we're not exposed to any of these chemicals one at a time. We're exposed to them oftentimes in the context of mixtures. And so we're looking at the mixture of these um, butyl phthalates. I mentioned monobutyl phthalate can be found uh, as a metabolite that is a, a metabolite of dibutyl phthalate. And um, so we're looking at dibutyl phthalate uh, metabolites and others here. And we saw, we saw an increased risk for gestational diabetes that doesn't quite reach statistical significance um, as we go from quartile one to quartile four. So among the individuals who have the highest concentrations, what we did see association with was impaired glucose tolerance, a twofold increased um, risk for those who had the highest concentrations of, of these butyl uh, phthalate uh, metabolites compared to those um, who had the lowest concentrations. So that's maybe the what, but maybe a when matters as well. So in this case, we're looking at these associations and we measured, I mentioned phthalates again, we're not persistent. So we measured these at different time points. Um, and so the first trimester and then early second trimester, and then looked at glucose levels later on in second trimester. So this is a prospective study, just looking at that fragrance associated phthalate metabolite, again, looking at it across quartiles. And the blue bar represents early pregnancy or first trimester. The red bar represents mid-pregnancy or that early second trimester. And you see that there are differences with respect to glucose levels. So we really actually see almost the inverse happening um, with respect to first trimester um, concentrations um, um, of phthalates compared to, um, or when looking at uh, glucose uh, from the gl glucose challenge test as a part of the gestational diabetes screening test. But we see the complete opposite of that um, for the early uh, pregnant, sorry, the mid-pregnancy exposure to phthalate, um, this particular phthalate uh, metabolite. In other words, at a time period in which the placenta has already fully developed, where you might be seeing this uptick in insulin resistance that is potentially due to placental lactogen. You see this association where that perturbation perhaps that may be um, really, I don't know, impacted by higher concentrations of these endocrine disrupting chemicals could be kind of offsetting the body's ability to kind of, you know, maintain normal uh, glucose metabolism. And so the fact that we then saw this association with impaired glucose tolerance um, may be of importance, particularly as it relates to second trimester um, um, phthalate metabolite concentrations. The who, um, again, going back to our traditional questions, we often stratify our analyses. We may look by race, ethnicity, or uh, by age, or other factors. The reason in this particular study that was done in the TIDES uh, cohort uh, was done because Asian individuals are two to three times more likely to experience gestational diabetes. So the question was, you know, do you see um, stronger associations in this particular group? And and we do. We see we see that um, this that those associations, particularly again with the mono, um, uh, uh, the, the butyl phthalate associations are, are stronger as well as the fragrance associated um, phthalate metabolite. And then. Here, we're looking again at that pooled cohort analysis um, that Kelly Ferguson and Barrett Welsh um, uh, looked at and stratified by um, um, race, ethnicity. And we, we see in this case where we're looking at urinary phthalate metabolite concentrations and we change pregnancy outcomes, we're looking here at preterm birth, that again, that the butyl phthalates seem to um, really um, be um, the, the worrisome uh, phthalate metabolites. And um, we see that Hispanic individuals um, have a stronger association uh, with respect to um, 
um, having higher concentrations of these chemicals for monobutyl phthalate and uh, preterm birth risk. And we see that also for monoisobutyl phthalate uh, for uh, the non-Hispanic Black population. If we switch over to um, the, you know, switch away from phthalates into PFOS chemicals, I want to bring your attention to um, looking at uh, some of these legacy PFOS. So again, these are the, so the surfactant chemicals that are a kind of a hot topic in the news right now. Um, and, um, and what we found using data from Project Viva is that individuals who have higher concentrations of uh, these chemicals, PFOS, PFOA, PFHXS, um, have about a twofold increased risk or odds of um, gestational hypertension. We do not see the same thing for preeclampsia. Um, and so that, um, that, you know, that's interesting and it's kind of uh, corroborates some of the findings from other um, studies. But it, as I mentioned to you before, it doesn't just stop at pregnancy. People have to go from this kind of meta, you know, altered metabolic state of pregnancy into a, you know, back to a metabolic reset that allows them to get back to normal. And the interesting thing that we found is again, for this is data from Project Viva again, and we're looking at early pregnancy PFAS concentrations and cardiometabolic health at the three year time point. And what we found is that individuals who had higher concentrations of these PFAS chemicals um, were more likely to have higher inflammation at three years postpartum. Um, they were also more likely to um, have um, altered um, um, sex hormone binding globulin levels, adiponectin, and uh, C-reactive protein levels. So there's, you know, it's really interesting that in this case, we're looking at a persistent chemical um, exposure where we're noting it in pregnancy and then we're looking at later life. But what about even beyond that? And that was looking at three years. I'm now looking out at 17 years out and I'm looking at adiposity measures. And what I'm showing you here is some of these, um, what used to be very prevalent uh, PFOS chemicals, PFOS and PFOA are associated with higher body mass index at 17 years out from the pregnancy, um, higher weight circumference for some of them, but also higher waist to hip ratio and mid upper arm circumference. And that kind of gets back to, you know, how can something that we're measuring in pregnancy and environmental exposure we're measuring in pregnancy really signal later life health and that perhaps that altered trajectory that we were proposing is something that's you know, really happening. And then what might we be able to do about that? But not, not quite there yet. Again, we're still in the, the kind of traditional questions. And this last piece I'll just land on is the how. Um, oftentimes in epidemiologic studies, we can't look at that very readily or as robustly as we might like to. And so we may lean on animal studies. And, and I had an opportunity through collaboration with one of the um, um, other P30 Center members that I met. Um, this was at University of Rochester Medical Center, um, um, Alyssa, Mer um, Alyssa Merrill and um, Marissa um, Terry. Um, ran this model, we, we said, what if we, instead of sacking their mice, which they often do after the mice deliver, what if we um, kept them alive? So these were mice that were dosed with um, um, these environment, these consumer product chemical mixtures. Um, it included PFOS, for example, um, with PFOA. It also included a phenol that I mentioned earlier. In this case, it was bisphenol A. And they were only dosed with this during pregnancy. So after pregnancy, they weren't. And then they were sacked at midlife, so roughly around the same time point um, of the human studies that we were looking at. And what I'm showing you here is that the mixture, the, the mice that got that mixture um, had elevated glucose. Um, they also had elevated lipid levels, including LDL and cholesterol levels. And in addition, they this was done using a DEXA. So looking at the control um, mouse that did not have um, that mixture during pregnancy compared to the one that did have the mixture during pregnancy. And they're stacked around six weeks after. So we're looking at the DEXA before the sac. So this, this is looking at the purple versus kind of the brownish color. The purple indicates um, more visceral fat. So that panel B, um, shows that the mice that had the mixture in pregnancy had more visceral fat um, compared to the mice that did not have um, that endocrine disrupting chemical or ECC mixture. 
So, okay. I, I hope that I've shown you that, you know, and this is again, very high level that we, there's a lot already out there about, um, you know, these, these studies, but how do we move towards health equity? How do we move towards solution? And I think part of it is starting to, you know, think about the ways in which we collect data and the ways in which we can do a better job in collecting our data to look not only at individual level factors. So I'm showing you on the right-hand side, the individual level factors, we may, ex we may exclusively collect environmental exposures and health outcomes. Um, we often will collect, um, you know, assigned group memberships such as race, ethnicity or socioeconomic status or ability level um, and, and so on. But to, to think beyond that and start collecting things like behavioral factors that may be sources of environmental exposures that are, are, that are also inextricably linked to the structural level factors that we're thinking about and the neighborhood level factors. And so just to you know, quickly show you some of the ways that we've thought about doing this, um, I mentioned to you some of the chemicals that we saw most striking associations with were those that were found in personal care products. And if in this case, we're looking at racial ethnic inequities as it relates to endocrine disrupting chemical associated personal care products. There's a lot of bars here, um, I know. So I just wanna draw your attention to the fact that hair gel, perfume and nail polish use are much more commonly um, and, and significantly used um, um, by um, black and um, Hispanic individuals, whereas cosmetics are much more uh, commonly used by non-Hispanic white individuals. and it doesn't just stop there. We ran, we did a study back in the early 2000s called the Greater New York Care Product Study. And what I just want to highlight about this study is it's about the, you know, going beyond our traditional questions and maybe asking questions that are specific to particular uh, populations of individuals. So in this case, we were really interested in understanding hair product use because this is a particularly um, um, culturally specific um, exposure pattern that may or that may pathway rather that may um, lead to higher exposure concentrations of fragrance related uh, chemicals. We asked about different types of products, different brands, and frequency and duration of use in a population of over 350 um, individuals, and we validated the questionnaire in multiple study populations. This is just to show you some of those differences. So these were even kind of more striking differences than the ones that I showed you with the other personal care products, and so uh, much higher use among. Um, Black um, individuals compared to kind of any other group. And because this was done in New York, we were able to look at this, um, recognizing the heterogeneity in the Black population, for example. It's worth also noting that um, the information is available oftentimes on consumer products around ingredients, but not to its fullest. So for example, in personal care products, the Food and Drug Administration up until recently did not require any type of disclosure of some of these um, things. So if you look at fragrance on the back of a product, it's hundreds of different chemicals, which is inclusive of things like phthalates. Um, so you may see something like fragrance or something like placenta, for example, which can be in some hair products. And what's worth noting is that about at the time that the study was done, about 50% of the products were labeled um, um, contain, as containing um, endocrine disrupting chemicals that were being used by um, African-American individuals, only about 7% uh, for non-Hispanic white individuals. These products are mixtures, so they contain a host of different chemical groups. Uh, we shared our list of over 250 uh, products that were from the Greater New York Care Products Study, our commonly used um, hair products, um, with Silent Spring Institute and Jessica Helm um, and others at the Institute actually sent this out to a, a lab, an independent lab and published paper that got a lot of press um, around um, each and every one of those commonly used products that we found in the Greater New York Care Products Study contain multiple endocrine disrupting chemicals. Again, these um, were things that were being targeted to Black individuals to uh, be used. So we followed up that work looking at hormonal activity and found that among those commonly used hair products, that every single one of them had um, was hormonally active using a hormone receptor assay, ranging from its ability to either operate as an estrogen uh, receptor agonist to um, um, a progesterone agonist or antagonist. Um, so, that, you know, again, these are consumer products. These are things that are sitting on the shelves, people likely think are safe because maybe they think they've already been tested when indeed they aren't. So the, the pluses represent agonistic activity, the minuses represent 
um, antagonistic op, um, activity and the zeros represent that, that, there, that there were, but each row um, shows some sort of activity. So what about the people who use these products? How does that relate back to those chemicals I was talking about? So again, these are data from the ergo study um, based here in the Boston area. And I just wanna draw your attention to, um, this is a heat map and I'm just to kind of orient us for a second. This is among hair oil users. So people who used hair oils within the, the last um, uh, 24 to 48 hours. And um, that upper box there, again, that MEP, that fragrance associated chemical. So people who use them compared to who, those who did not had concentrations of that fragrance associated uh, chemical that was 125% higher. So it, use does translate to higher concentrations. It's, it's getting through the, the, the skin. Um, the, the scalp is quite porous and it's impacting um, what uh, folks are exposed to. So we asked the question, is there an association between hair product use and preterm birth? And we looked at this at different time points across pregnancy, as well as the frequency of use. So daily versus less than daily, you know, relative to never. And what we found was that the earlier time periods in pregnancy didn't matter so much, but as people approached labor um, and delivery, so this is around roughly about 30 um, to, uh, to 35 weeks gestation, that daily use of hair oils was associated with an eight day earlier delivery. Um, that wasn't the case for less than daily um, use. We also saw this for birth weight. So individuals that were daily users and what I'm showing you here are distributions of sex specific birth weight for gestational age Z scores. And so the non-users are uh, folks who are in blue um, in the distribution. Um, less than daily is in red and green is daily users. And you'll note that there's a thickening of the tails and a shift to the left, meaning uh, lower birth weight. And so that's actually on the order so that daily use of hair oils was associated with a 300 gram lower birth weight. I just wanna note that we often blame the individual or we say, okay, well, why, do, why are these people using these products? Why do, you know, why do they have to use these products? And I wanted to mention the upstream factors that these products are being targeted for use in certain communities. So this was actually recently published by a doctoral student in our lab, Marissa Chan, who showed that um, place matters. So we tend to get our personal care products not online, but actually in uh, kind of big box stores and so on. And so when we looked at this question of like what's on the shelves in different communities, um, what we're showing here is that um, that 2.32 represents a risk ratio. Mission Hill is one of the uh, communities that has the highest percentage of uh, Black and highest percentage poverty here in the Boston area. And relative to uh, downtown um, on the shelves of stores in Mission Hill, uh, those stores are much more likely to contain uh, products that contain more harmful ingredients per Environmental Working Group's risk score. Um, they also are more likely to contain uh, products that are leave on. So people are putting these products on and leaving them on as opposed to kind of rinse off something like shampoo or conditioner. Okay, so what can we do about it? Let's really think about those interventions. And I'm going to finish this talk by just highlighting a few that um, are ongoing. Um, I just want to note that when we look at environmental justice research, this was um, um, a review article that Joan Casey and um, I and others um, did um, a few months back. Um, it was published. And it's been interesting to note that the methods that uh, tend to be used don't aren't necessarily inclusive of intervention studies in um, the space of thinking about consumer product chemicals. Much of the work in epidemiology specifically just looks at stratification. Um, so looking at effect modifications, so like those racial ethnic stratifications. So they again, go back to answering the question of who's at risk, but not really kind of doing anything about it. In exposure science, there's more regression. So like looking at what Marissa Chan did, like we're, you know, based on the place, um, what uh, community or, you know, um, individuals are at highest risk. But what about using methods like, you know, G computation, where we can build a hypothetical intervention and predict, um, you know, what might occur with respect to disease outcomes if we were to reduce environmental exposures? Um, so in this case, again, this is actually from that same paper looking at phthalate metabolites and preterm birth that Barrett Welch and um, um, Kelly Ferguson uh, did in collaboration with myself and others. 
And what they showed here is that if you were to bring the concentrations of the non-Hispanic Black population down um, in for phthalates down to what um, non-Hispanic white populations look like, or if you did that the same thing for Hispanic uh, individuals and you brought it down to the concentrations of non-Hispanic whites uh, individuals, you would reduce the total count or the percentage um, significantly um, in some cases. And um, even though in some cases it doesn't reach statistical significance, you know, a 13% um, drop is, is not a trivial drop when you're talking about um, um, disparities that are quite considerable. So that that is something that we might want to do if we um, don't have the money um, or timing to be able to, you know, so maybe our studies should integrate these, these methodologies. We're actually doing um, a, a, a clinical trial right now um, through two intervention studies, the IHELP study and the DEEP study, where we're um, improving environmental health literacy around these consumer product chemicals in clinician populations and in doulas. Um, and it's a narrative-based educational tool that we've um, utilized in partnership with our first region, PESU here um, in the area. So we worked with uh, doctors uh, Naima Joseph and Blair Wiley um, to do this work. And just to give you a little uh, pre, you know, preview of this, what we've shown so far, so far we have two, over 200 individuals enrolled in this study uh, for IHELP. And we give a pre and post environmental health literacy um, survey. And we're looking at things ranging from awareness of phthalate, uh, reproductive health impacts to uh, regulatory interest. And what we can already see is that we significantly change many of these metrics um, around environmental health literacy as it pertains to consumer product chemicals, particularly in this case, phthalates. This particular score, score is called the Pearl score that we're looking at where it kind of sums up all of these different uh, dimensions. Um, other things that we're doing is we're working within our P30 center and our P42 center around a variety of environmental justice um, initiatives and recognizing that our community, you know, and we're thinking about consumer product chemicals, food insecurity, personal care product safety, or, um, even water concerns are on our community's minds. Uh, much of this work um, has gone well even beyond our lab. So we we um, we do uh, do it yourself um, product uh, um, um, opportunities even in Africatown, Alabama, um, and we have a podcast on uh, called Beauty Plus Justice, as well as an environmental racism story map that. Um, um, one second place recently uh, that one of our, our set of our students did um, in, around the space in this work. Because at the end of the day, what we really want to do is make sure that we integrate these questions and start thinking about solutions as we really try to eliminate preventable health disparities so that we can achieve the goal of health equity um, as we are moving up this, this pyramid. And um, on that note, I want to acknowledge my research team and I can take any questions. Thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Uh, please feel free folks, if you uh, have questions that you'd like to ask, you can raise your hand and I'll call on people. Um, if for whatever reason you aren't able to use video at this point and you wanna put things in the chat, that's fine as well. Um, Tamara, I actually have a question for you. I was noticing something interesting on uh, the phthalates and glucose tolerance slide. This was a, quite a while ago, but uh, it looked like there were very different relationships in the fourth quartile between exposure earlier and later. In, I mean, it was all first, second trimester, but exposure in the first versus second trimester. And I was wondering what you made of that particular difference. You know, it's funny, Stephanie, because when I first saw that, I was like, oh, of course, that that makes complete sense. Like first trimester is a time period of insulin, increased insulin sensitivity. That's why people have morning sickness. And, you know, that that's where my brain went. And then it dawned on me that I'm not sure that that actually it tracks as well. And that it might be a finding that is really attributed to more noise that's happening. Um because it is more distal. And um, and so we we are trying to start thinking through ways that in which we can parse that out. One of which is this, this partnership with our colleagues um, 
at the University of Rochester where we can kind of think through that a little bit more and also uh, think about ways in which we can use utilize technology like CGMs and other things. Um, so we, we have those data available too. So we're, we're looking into it. All right, Maria, you have a question. Matthew was ahead of me. Apologies, Matthew, you have a question. Her question's probably better. Do you wanna go first? All right, I'll just ask my questions. Um, so Dr. James Todd, it's a pleasure to see you again. Uh, although I'm very fascinated about the substantive findings, and I'd love to kind of pick your brain a little bit more offline about them. One of the things that this uh, Zoom call, this community of practice is, is very diverse across career stages, including a number of residents and other trainees. And you've been presenting work by uh, trainees of your own, as well as other colleagues who are at various career stages. And you've also been engaging a lot of community members in some of this work, um, like with the doulas and other people. And I was wondering, when you've been bringing people into this new area of knowledge and awareness, where they're starting to realize that materials that in their daily lives are relevant for their health and their community's health, what's the kind of emotional resonance you get? Do people really throw themselves into this work? Is it kind of more detached? I'm just kind of wondering how the vibe has been, which is kind of a general question rather than a subject matter question, but it's such an interesting process and team you've put together. It's a That's a great question, um, Matt. Like one of the things that, you know, when I first started on this and it probably maybe about 10 years ago dawned on me, oh my goodness, I have, we have to take a different approach. So we'd go, you know, inevitably, um, we'd have to we'd report back our findings to the communities that we were working with. And the fear on people's faces, right? Like, you're, they were like, okay, now I have to go home and throw out everything, all done, you know. Um, the, and realizing as an investigator, like, I'm a, I'm a scientist, like, I'm, I'm just genuinely interested in this, but that's probably not the right approach, you know, if I'm going to be, in, you know, working with communities and really trying to figure out ways in which they're sustainable, reduction in exposure. And so it, it's led to like a different way in which we've needed to, to, to do this work. And I think that that's been, it, maybe about five or so years ago, it's been an exciting time where we started this um, communications group that the students really pushed for. Um, they, like we really wanna learn how to do effective science communication. It's not a strategy or a tool that we learn in our kind of mainstream learning environment. And then that's allowed us to kind of, you know, it all kind of dovetails and circle, circles well, because then that allows us to be more effective when we're speaking to community members. Their work and their ideas inform what we do and it's kind of back and forth. So the, the Beauty Plus Justice podcast was not something I ever thought to do, but this was like something that grew out of what community members had said they really wanted to learn more. And the students were really excited. So they, the students are the ones who, who narrate, produce, like all of that. They were like, can you just show up, Tamara? And we'll, we'll bring the people, you just show up. Um, so I, I, I think to answer your question, um, it's been a journey. And I, I'm, I'm excited about, you know, they bring, it's been a joyful journey, but it's definitely been a hard journey to learn. How do you do this better? than I think the way that we've traditionally been taught to do it sometimes. I don't know if that's interesting. All right, can we sneak in one last question from Maria? All right, go for it, Maria. Hi, Dr. James Todd. You know, I, I've been an admirer of your work for several years and I learn something new every time I hear you speak. Um, and for the OEM people, I'm an OBGYN here at UCSF. And, you know, one of the things that we are struggling with in OBGYN is a big racial disparities in maternal mortality and preterm birth. Um, and, you know, I, I see that these things need to be addressed on multiple levels. I mean, you know, we shouldn't, people shouldn't have to, you know, bring a scientific paper into the drugstore to figure out which hair product they're going to use. Um, but given that it is something that somebody might need to do, do you have resources that you have used to make it easy for people? I mean, I, you know, when I have time to talk to doulas and we can go into endocrine disruption, you know, we can, I, we can learn stuff 
and use that to sort of change. But if I have 10 minutes with a patient and I just want to give her an infographic, is there somewhere you can point me? So two things. So first of all, Maria, I, so like we need to disconnect. We both, we should make that happen. So this is, this is great that I get to see you here. Um, so to answer that question in general, we've been contacted by um, environmental working group because their app, as you may know, um, and what I didn't say here is that something to the, to the effect of 90% of, of products in China, our Chinatown, Boston's Chinatown, were not available in the environmental working group skin deep app. So you can go into it, you can download this app on your phone, go into the store, um, use the barcode, and it would just, they, they didn't exist. It was not that nearly that bad for some of the other uh, neighborhoods, but um, but it you know significantly lower uh, percentage or I should say higher degree of missingness in Black and Brown communities, and um, so they've reached out to us and, and asked could could we partner with them to basically add based on because we have now a database of about thirty four thousand different products um, the end you know, their ingredients, all that, um, that we could then subsequently share. Um, but to your point, I think it's beyond that, like, what can, can you get the infographic? And so we do do a lot of infographics. We do a lot of creation of that. And so I'd be really excited to talk to you more about it. Thank you so very much for the wonderful talk, Tamara James Todd. Really appreciate having had you here today. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining Occupational Environmental and Climate Medicine Grand Rounds. Uh, I think the uh, info to mark your attendance, if you'd like, is probably in the chat. Sam, is it in the chat? Yeah, yeah see I registration. Can, can and he'll, Sam will drop it there again uh, so that you can mark down your attendance so you'll be eligible for CE credit, hopefully, uh, when that becomes available in the future. Thank you all. Uh, no, sorry, go ahead, Sam. No, no, yeah, thank thank. Thank you to everyone involved in this. And uh, our next grand rounds in two weeks will be uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Tamer talking about management of a cobalt 57 exposure. Sounds really interesting. Hope to see you then. <laughs>